we never had a team like so both sanjeev used to code and i used to do everything else <laughs> including doing deliveries i used to go and take some of the stuff that i had on my bike and do deliveries in hsr kolmangla i guess anybody who has been following startup ecosystem for the last few years uh, cannot not know about you and sort of look up to you um the journey of misho and i think you as a team has been super inspiring and it has been i would say nothing less than extraordinary right i think you've been you've taken on two giants pretty much uh with much deeper pocket with a lot more experience and and bench strength and you've sort of at times i would say survive but i think now it feels like you're thriving and it takes a lot to get that done and there's a lot we can all learn from you and the team and everything that misho has done so thank you again for taking out time and being here with us today Oh, thank, thank you so you much for having me here. No, no, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, you know, everybody just settling in, but everybody is very excited and looking forward to the next 12 months. Uh, everybody has a lot of dreams, a lot of aspirations, some fears also because it's a, it's going to be a challenging program. Um, if there are some pieces of advice that you would give them on how can they make the best or most out of the next 12 months uh, what would what advice i can kind of share from my experience that could be very useful to everyone here and i think one thing which is very unique about the time now which is 2023 the world has changed right like the last two years everyone has seen how the tech ecosystem mostly but overall the entire overhang of pandemic a lot has changed right and i was just thinking like what experience from like misho's early journey is relevant to people while preparing for the new time right so when i look back like sanjeev and i started the company back in 2015 and this is mid of 2015 and if you'll remember the beginning of like 20, 2014 and the beginning of 2015 was a boom time in the startup ecosystem like there were some 100 startups just in services and food delivery and i don't know what all everyone got funded lots of people were coming and starting up companies and sanjeev and i at that point in time got together and we say hey we are very excited and we are very passionate about building this misho uh, at that point in time it was called something else but to really bring the entire small business economy in india online and we started the company in 2015 like july 2015 and i remember two months later everything faltered down like it was everything lots of these early stage startups shut down there was a two year winter when no early stage funding happened actually so something like today <laughs> correct and and it's like we have just started and we haven't raised a single penny and like suddenly now people are saying it's funding winter and you won't get money for the next two years you bootstrap you make revenue you become profitable on day one right like things that have started to become popular again and i know a lot of my friends who also started up during the same time most of them shut down they said ki now it's too hard maybe it's not the best time we will when the boom time comes back again we will think about starting again because right now there is no capital and if i don't have capital i can't hire people i can't hire people i can't build products right so i think that was basically the same time and i i feel like the same a similar time is now and sanjeev and i took a very different decision than some of our friends and we said we will build it now right like to us it doesn't matter whether it's a funding winter or funding summer like to us what matters is hey we believe in a problem we believe in a mission and we believe the best time to solve this is now and we will do it now it's going to be a tougher journey and we'll brace for it and i thought i will share some of the experiences and learnings at least from the first couple of years right i think the biggest biggest learning is and by the way that has helped us today even today so now we just completed 8 years of misho and when we started back in 2015 people used to believe that horizontal e-commerce company in india can never be profitable and they still believed it maybe until a year ago everyone believed that hey they can just never make money and we recently turned profitable like about a month ago and <laughs> and i was telling someone like the reason it is possible is because of our early years like we started at a time when we did not have capital 
So one of the core parts of a culture were always being very frugal and extremely capital efficient. So for example, the first one year when we started in 2015, for the first one year, I would say like the first seven months, um, it was just Sanjeev and I, like we never had a team. Like so both Sanjeev used to code and I used to do everything else, <laughs> including doing deliveries. I used to go and take some of the stuff that I had on my bike and do deliveries in HSR Core Mangla area. And I used to think that, hey, it's great because I can go and even speak to customers, get feedback, and we don't have to be a delivery boy to kind of do some of these deliveries until we figure out how this business works. And Sanjeev did everything. Like, he built out the app, built out the website. Like, we made something, it didn't work, then we shut it down, we made something else. But we had only one engineer, and that was Sanjeev. But I think it, because it was just me and Sanjeev doing this, like almost for about eight months, some of the principle that we still have in the companies, we started to do a lot of things ourselves, which in many companies I see people delegate very, very quickly. Like one of the most important things is being very close to users. So both Sanjeev and I used to do customer support for each and every user. So every time we will go and deliver a customer, we say, hey, this is my phone number and this is the phone number of my partner and we are always available. So you call us at midnight, you have a problem, you call us at in the morning, we are always available. And we, by the way, realize that that's the best way for you to grow and learn. Yeah. So some of the principles of being very close to users and build something um, which, is, which really solves the customer problem also basically happened because there was no one else to kind of do it. Yeah. And we did that for seven, eight months. Then we basically raised our angel round, which was a very, very small round. Um, and even after that, then even when we went like raised a series A, which is three, four years down the line, even until then, both Sanjeev and I used to do all customer support. Because by then, we had the option of delegating it to someone else. But we realized that, hey, because both Sanjeev and I were so close to our users from day one, that we used to get good or bad feedback like very quickly. Yeah. Like something goes off, someone will tell you, and then we know, hey, we need to fix this before anything else. And I believe that builds a very important element in your culture. So we call it being user first. And I believe some of the products that solve like big problems at scale in the country today, you've been part of Urban Company, I'm sure. Yeah. Some of the similar learnings, but that was very, very important. Like just being close to the user in the early days, finding those insights that every other company will miss. Because there was no very, we did not, when we started Misho, a lot of companies at that point in time that were getting funded, but ABC of India, like someone is saying, hey, I'm Uber of India, someone is saying, I am like DoorDash of India, I'm Amazon of India, and so on. We built a platform that enabled consumers to transact on WhatsApp from small businesses. It was very hard to find a parallel to that anywhere else in the world, right? So we built something very, very original. original. The simple reason we could do it because we are very, very close to the consumer base. We realized the reason a lot of people in India don't buy stuff online because they only use one app, which is WhatsApp. So people keep making these fancy websites or apps, but if people just don't know any other app to use than WhatsApp, then what's the point? So he said, we will bring commerce to where people, people are. And the only reason we got access to this insight were we were very, very close to the customers. So we could really build something super original. I think that I would say is like one big learning, right? So some of the opportunities that come up in times like these, when you don't have as many resources, I think it gives you an opportunity to find gold that everyone else, everyone else will miss, right? That is one. I would say second thing which we learned, which was a very, very important lesson, I would say from the early days is, which is kind of obvious, was just being very capital efficient in everything that we do. I think as a company, we've always been very lean. So today, the entire Misho team is about 1,200 people. If you look at an Amazon, it's about 30,000 people. Maybe Flipkart is even more. And you compare the number of people we have. Even among like, some of the companies at our scale, the number of people we have in our company full-time is one of the lowest. And the reason we have built a very lean team is because we started at a time when we had no money. So we're always a lean team and it stayed that way. Yeah. And again, if we had started this company in 2019, 2020, I can tell you it would be at least three, four times our size today. Right, because you would have raised a lot of money on day one, and you'll say you can find reasons of why you should have one more person, two more people, three more people, right? 
and i think again some of the core tenets of building a business with very high capital efficiency being extremely frugal helped us and and i think that's a very important thing i believe like some of the companies i know like a lot of people here are folks who want to start up companies or join like early stage startups you will do it after the program and i believe some of these elements i think would again matter a lot when people will start companies i think people who are close to their consumer base a lot more will find those creative things which everyone else will miss people who will have a core foundation of being extremely capital efficient and being frugal i think would be able to kind of again solve some bit of this and maybe if i have to pick the last learning i don't want to give a very long monologue i am sure like people have a lot of questions here but if i have to pick the last thing which was also very important from the first two or three years is we realized that the early team matters quite a lot because again we never had money for a long time by the way like we raised a series a when we had just one month of salaries money left in the bank account so it was very very close right it was it was a time when like we just did not have much money during that year the team that we had like by the way we had i think less than 20 people in the company would be like about five people out of that would be like engineers product managers in that function 15 i would say in operations and other business operations we had 20 people the company is already out of money for two years we give we could not give anyone any hike and we just were very open that hey like we have not been able to raise around yet because of the macro climate the funding environment is not great and like i think we have to get to a larger scale before we do it not a single person in the company by the way left and most of them i would say at that point in time were underpaid because we did not have as much money to be paid all of them stayed there was a time when we were running out of money i still remember two or three of our developers basically came forward and they said that hey what if we do something on the side and make some revenue so we can fund the business that we believe in for a few months more because our business is growing people want to see scale before they fund the business and i think we also started a six months services business and we used to basically make software for companies in haryana and gurgaon uh for about 6 months i still remember we made some 35 lakhs of revenue by making this software for some of these companies these were like tier 2 towns that did not have developers so we did that we got 35 lakhs which was 3 months of runway so we could extend runway by 3 months again and again our team took initiative ke hey we will do this so that you have some more money so that we have more time to prove out the business we have yeah and the most important lesson here is in times like these i think when people are just because again in great times everyone can give the money and you realize a lot of people who join your team or join the company they join it either for the money or the compensation or how much stocks you're giving but when none of that is there people join it because they believe in the same mission as you right they get inspired by solving the problem for the same audience they like each other as a group and for them that hey they are doing their life's work yeah i think building those kind of teams are much easier in times like these than what was possible in 20 and 21 i have seen in those times it's much harder to see who is really connected to the mission and who is coming for some of the other reasons and i still believe one of the best things we did by the way like to build a successful company i think it's 90% luck 10% everything else but one of the things that you're lucky with is the early stage team we had like people who were just with us in all kinds of times and i think that's a very important thing as well like a lot of people who will go out and when you build a company what kind of team you want to build or if you join an early stage company what kind of team you want to join again i think matters quite a lot because in times like these there's no easy way of tricking someone with hey take this number just come and do whatever i want to do even if you don't connect with the mission i think people tend to find thing that they really love and and i think that was again we were lucky that we started in that time i i tell people i would not have loved to start a company in 2021 because mm. because of all these things building company in 2015 to 2017 was definitely harder but some of my best memories 
of building Misho are also in that time period. Because we solved very tough problems without much resourcing and everyone just kept punching above the weight to make sure the company survives and eventually thrives. So yeah, I think that's, that's basically what I wanted to share with you. I, I hope some of that is useful at some point in time and I'm happy to kind of take some that yeah. you have. No, no, absolutely. I think very well said, I think being close to customers, building that muscle and uh, building that frugal, frugal mindset, which I think while it also protects capital, I think it also forces you to prioritize. Correct. Right? Uh, in, in an early stage, you can't do everything. When you have a lot of money, you just throw money at the problem versus really going back to customers and asking what is it that truly matters to them and then solving that. Uh, and I think in an early stage company, joining for the right reasons is much more important. Uh, I think being clear as to why you want to take that risk and why are you signing up for all of that uh, hard work is very important. And I think it helps in self-selecting uh, at the right time. You know, I think very, very useful. Uh, and as, as our students go through the program, we are going to put them through a lot of these setups where they have to get close to customers, uh, hustle uh, against all odds. And I think some of this will, uh, will have to be built as muscle over the next 12 months. Now, I think uh, super, super helpful start with it. I think I have a few questions before I hand it over to all of our, to all of our students. We've all heard about Misho Mantra, and I think you uh, referred to some of them here as well. If you were to share your top three favorite ones, uh, what would those be? That have you know uh, survived the test of time, and you know something that our students can also uh, use almost on a daily basis. Yeah, no, it's very hard to pick three among the mantras I have um, because I love all of them so much. But the first one, which I started with, I think the first one is the first mantra we basically wrote down, which is user first, and it continues to be the number one. And the reason it's so important is I've realized like almost all the most important decisions we've made as a company will always come by being user first. Be it all the pivots, landing on the idea that eventually worked. So it's definitely my favorite. If I have to pick another one after this, I think in terms of uniqueness, let me pick some unique ones, right? So the second one, which was, which played again a very important role in the early stage of our company is a mantra which we call as speed over perfection, right? When we started the company, like most people, we used to also love the craft and the work we do, right? Like how did the app look like? Like how does the website look like? How does, when I write a document, how does that look like? And, and you don't realize, but as people say, right? Like the good is the enemy of great, right? So people tend to optimize so much of basically getting their app right that they take two months more, three months more, four months more. And they forget the products improve, not because you think it some, looks something great or not, it improves because of feedback. So you want to optimize for getting the product in hands of the customer very quickly so that you can start to learn and then improve with version one, version two, version three. And, and that's what this mantra is about, that hey, optimize for speed rather than perfecting the product the first time, almost all beautiful things get created by iterations. Yeah. And not by like, hey, I will do something once and it'll be magic. Like magic doesn't happen, right? Like what works is flywheels, feedback, iterations. And I think this is a mantra that we spent a lot of time. And I think one of the our early days, we said, so Sanjeev and I started the company in 15, we said, hey, we will try doing a company for two years. If two years later we realize the company is not working, we'll shut down and go back and do our jobs. So he said, we have a runway of 24 months. So now for us to have the highest chances of basically making a business successful, we need to have as many chances at the goal as we can, which is how many new products we can try and how many times we can iterate. So do everything possible to reduce the time of getting something out and learning and again and again. And we could, like, our third, third pivot worked, which we basically got to in 18 months. I know a lot of people who can't make even one pivot in like two years. So they have lesser number of shots at the goal as compared to us. And I think that's this value about, which is optimized for speed or perfection. Yeah. The third value I would say, which is, which is also very, very unique, um, and again, the reason I will 
here mention is i think for the audience here it's also very relevant is some of the best people i worked with like some of the best performers at me show have tend they tend to be people who have the strongest growth mindset right what does growth mindset mean first of all i think that is also very very important there are different types of people there are people who have a very strong goal mindset right they think about a goal and say i want to work backwards from this goal and make it happen right there are people who have a growth mindset people who have growth mindset they say every day every minute i need to be a better version of myself right they optimize for learning they optimize for growing at every moment like it's not hey my feedback happens every quarter so i will improve every quarter they're just thinking about hey how do i grow all the time and it's the same thing is the speed of perfection but the product is not your app but the product is yourself what can you do to iterate on yourself and improve again on a daily basis i would say this is something i have seen the highest correlation of people who do really well in misho and i have seen people who do really well in life are also the people who tend to be very high on growth mindset like they never take feedback judgmentally like every time they're trying they seek feedback more often they never almost never take feedback judgmentally and they're always trying to figure out how to improve something and how to become better and this is just an endeavor for life irrespective yeah. of how much they have achieved how senior or junior they are in life right and the reason i say it is you will realize most people when they are young have better growth mindset and as we age and as we think that we know what we do very well this growth mindset keeps going down yeah and that's why as you become more and more senior this becomes even more important because hard to find senior people who have growth growth, growth good growth mindset they will tell you hey i know how things are done they will tell you hey i know what is good or bad and and i feel like that's when the growth starts to plateau very quickly so one of the mantra again which is very close to our heart is how do we create a culture where we foster this growth mindset in everyone from the junior most folks in the company to the senior most and reward people who are also like with very strong growth mindset so we have to pick three up pick three for you all right those are amazing mantras to uh to take home and almost like think about almost every day right i mean you you talk about or uh, these are all mindset i would say uh, mantras which should translate into a mindset on how do you take decisions how do you it's like a culture correct and culture is defined as when nobody is looking at you what do you do right what are the actions you are taking when nobody is looking at you so if somebody can do these three then you know that's the right mindset that's the uh, that's the mindset so i think amazing amazing uh Uh, you you talked about you know rewarding and creating this culture i mean ac- across these mantras and I, there are more mantras but how do you do that it's it's much easier said than done right i mean and uh, would you mind sharing a little bit about that what goes behind the scenes into creating a, a high performance culture based on these uh, amazing mantras yeah and well that's the harder thing right like it's easy to put some of these yeah. things some of these things on the wall then have it in the hall right yeah so it's much much tougher and the reason it is tougher is because people talk about it and then people forget it um and i feel it's a i would also say just purely from the same thing as growth mindset i think it's a journey it's always wip so it's about hey how can we have a culture which is living up to these values much more today as compared to what it was to uh, as yesterday so for example i let me take example of the first one that i started which is called user first so one of the things of being user first is we have to stay close to customers and the leadership right at the top has to basically role model this so that everyone else does it right because what you see is some of the organization that i worked at before i started up me show i realized that people who are senior and senior and senior are also the most distant to their consumer they feel that ha my team will go and do research on the ground they will come and give me a report i will just sit in a board room and make decision based on what they put on the on the slide and hence their understanding of their customer is based on a powerpoint not based on who the customer is so we said we need to kind of role model this ourselves 
So on a quarterly basis, all the leadership in our company does um, a particular, for example, field visits. And there's a term for that in the company. It's called LOD. So LOD means listen or die, right? So in our team, like if someone tells you, hey, I'm going for an LOD, it means someone is going and speaking to a consumer, a seller, a delivery boy to kind of understand what can we do for them. And by the way, you speak to anyone at Misho and you say LOD, like everyone gets it and say, ha, I understand. It's, so people do LOD on a quarterly basis to discover new problems. When we start to do planning for the next year, suddenly you'll see a lot of people have planned their LOD on the ground. When people come with their project proposal and tell me like what do they want to do, the first section is almost always learnings from my last LOD, right? So it's like a symbol which is pasted everywhere, right? And I see this happen again and again and again and people also remember that, hey, every time anyone in the company proposes a new project or a product, the first question that the leadership asks is, hey, what did you learn from the LOD that gives you confidence that we should build this? Yeah. So then people know, hey, it's very important to do this. So it's basically rewarding, okay, hey, if you wanna make sure that you build things that the team will approve, it has to be from the user rather than from some report, from some research you've done on internet and so on. So that's how the culture rewards people. Those people essentially tend to go up. This is, this is a symbol which you kind of see multiple times during the day. And I think that's how culture is built. Like now, yeah. it comes very naturally to people that, hey, if I want to pick up a new opportunity, the first thing I need to do is an LOD. Hey, I, like something is going wrong in my areas that I own, this metric looks off. The first thing that people say, let me go and do an LOD. It comes very naturally to people. And that's when I know the culture is working. Yeah. Right? That's how I know things are improving. So I'll give you another example of like, for example, growth mindset. Um, so growth mindset, we wanted to foster this more and more. So we have a ritual in the company, which is called quarterly reflections. So every team, and this is again a very decentralized thing. Every team on a quarterly basis, comes together and does reflections and they say, hey, what worked well and what did not do so well? And what would I want to do better in the next quarter? Learning from this. And then they share these learnings with their manager, then their managers do the same thing and they it keeps bubbling up and reaches the leadership that, hey, the organization did re reflections around this and we felt that, hey, this is what we did well last quarter and this we could have done better. Hmm. When we started this exercise, I still remember two years ago, first reflection that we did, everyone was very guarded. No one wanted to share what did I not do well because then, hey, will someone use it against me in my next performance appraisal? Hey, will someone use it against me in my team? That, hey, I don't do well. Because in many organizations, people keep projecting that they're the best performers out there, right? Very common. So first time we did reflection, everything felt very guarded. People are like, huh, like everybody, you everything was better, perfect. but what we did was also good. Yeah. Correct? Now, I think we have done in two years, eight quarters, we have done eight reflections. Now when I see reflections, like people very, very openly share, hey, this did not do well. I think I did not think about this second order effect when I was trying to do this. Next time I'll do this. And do people do it very proactively and everyone celebrates. Yeah, it looks like good learning. I think I also made the same mistake and I'll also go change. So that whole stigma of being open with your vulnerabilities or things that you can improve on has gone away in the culture. That's yeah. what culture means, right? Like yeah. suddenly the culture has changed, their culture is rewarding being growth mindset rather than judging that, hey, because you have to improve on something, that means you're bad at it, yeah. which means you're not as good as someone else. So I think that judgment has gone away just because it has happened again and again and people have seen very senior people also come forward and share their reflections with everyone and no one looks at them negatively, then I can also do the same thing. Yeah. So I think these are some of the ways, some rituals, some symbols of how we bring this culture come to reality. Like these mantras essentially come yeah. into our team and you have to keep doing it. Right? Yeah. And I'm saying few things that are working, but I, if you ask me, I can tell you 10 things that are still not working that I'm yeah. trying to improve. And yeah. it's a journey. You yeah. can never kind of ever achieve perfection in it, but it's okay. Yeah, I think the reason I asked that question is because we are also trying to build a certain culture here. 
right? There's a culture of uh, learning, uh, curiosity, uh, questioning the status quo, uh, growth mindset, uh, because this is that period for everybody. And you know, we want everybody to celebrate that and do that almost automatically by the end of the program uh, and take that with them for the rest of the life. So that's why I was curious as to you know, what are things that we can also try. Um, I think uh, another question that I would ask is, you know, outside in, it looks like Misho has had a roller coaster, right? Right. Uh, and while it's uh, looking quite good from outside in right now, I'm sure it was very challenging. Uh, so how do you keep yourself motivated? Or how did you keep yourself motivated through all the ups and downs that I'm sure journey has thrown at you? Uh, any, any building journey is tough, and I'm assuming after eight years, it must have been quite tough. So how did you think about inspiration, motivation? What did you do? Um, and especially, I'm, I'm, the reason I'm asking, because the next 12 months is, is going to be quite intense and challenging, and maybe humbling in parts for a lot of the students here, because they'll be thrown into new and uncomfortable situations. So how do they keep themselves motivated and inspired? Like what worked for you, which potentially can also work for folks here? Oh, no, it's a very good question. I think this is, to solve exactly this thing is why we have mission statements in companies or mission statement in life, right? Like Misho is my mission in life. Like what I do every day, how, why do I get up and feel energetic every day is because I feel like I'm on a mission with this and I have like 1200 people along with me who are also on the same mission. And so I'll give you like some anecdotes again that will help you understand how we have kept people around this. So one of the things we learned in our early days, so our, because our mission statement was helping small businesses, helping women who were starting some of their businesses for the first time, we realized like a lot of people who used to join us and stay with us for longer period were people who used to feel proud about making positive impact in their lives. We discovered this very quickly, right? And then we realized that actually that's also the reason why Sanjeev and I like doing what we do. So what we started doing in the early days for the senior most person to the junior most again, at when we are interviewing people for roles, we will also make them speak to few sellers and few consumers, right? and say, why don't you go and speak to them? And we realized it used to act as a great filter. Some people will go and speak to them and say, I spoke to that small business, understood their problems. And the fact that, hey, this business really helps them achieve something feels very inspiring to me and I also want to be part of this mission. And people who did not enjoy that problem as much ended up basically not joining. And we realized we basically got a lot of people who are aligned to our mission much more deeply because of this. And once you get people who are aligned to impact, who are aligned to the mission statement, I think this problem of motivation and inspiration goes away. Because everything they do on a daily basis, they feel that, hey, I'm making that next progress in making that impact even more. Right? Like we have seen people, like people come up and say that, hey, I launched that feature which doubled income of particular sellers on the platform and I feel very proud that hey they'll be able to do things that they could not do before. To kind of keep compounding this dose of motivation and inspiration we also tend to get a lot of our sellers as part of our town halls, as part of our weekly all hands and our consumers, our, our uh, team members listen from these consumers and sellers like in person and they'll ask them some of these sellers will share their stories that, hey, because of the Misho platform, their business doubled or tripled, and they bought their first car in their lives because of the income that they made from Misho. Imagine like someone who's part of the team who worked on a feature that enabled the seller to achieve these goals. Like, you will go and tell these stories to your parents and grandparents for life. Yeah. And that's what pride is about, right? Like, that gives you the positive meaning in life okay, because of our existence we are able to make so much impact to so many people and I believe that's the thing which lasts long yeah. everything else does not so pe keeping people close to the impact that you create eventually I think as much as you can keep doing it is what keeps people motivated inspired every day they will yeah. come with the same energy and say no I'm going to pull something off because I really love and feel proud of all the work that we are doing. Yeah, so I think it, it took me back to my urban company days as well. 
something very similar we used to do similar i think similar sort of impact and mission orientation there and i think it served as well so i can relate to that also but i think having that mission orientation in life which could translate to different parts of life right like Correct. your work your personal growth journey and all of that i think is very critical uh, to to give you that energy you need when things get tough and things will get tough uh, no i think last question before we head into the rapid fire round um, <laughs> we've all heard great stories i know you talked about funding winter for the first two years of your existence but we've all heard great stories about how good you and sanjeev were at pitching uh, <laughs> and uh, i don't know if they are true or not uh, but we will all love to maybe hear the first five six lines you used to uh, open your pitch with uh, which used to you know make me show irresistible <laughs> I don't think I was, or both Sanjeev and I were ever good, as good as you heard some bit of this. I've realized like, one of the things that really helped us um, in 2017-18, so I would say like 2017-18 is when the ecosystem started to come out of the funding winter. And the good thing was we have, until then we had found PMF. So when you suddenly give capital to a very capital staffed business, like magic happens like business goes up like this which is also like has the right pmf so correct so if you like we extremely capital staffed so we used to like find 1 rupee and do this find 1 rupee and do this and now suddenly you give it like 10 rupees and suddenly you see the business starts to explode that's what happened so we raised our series a in mid 2017 um we grew 100x in the next 12 months and we grew 100x in the next 12 months we also raised like three rounds of funding within those 12 months we raised okay. a series a series b series c our the company so company raised from like we had we had in total raised less than a million or less than 500000 with less than 3 crores over two years when we raised some money from angel and then yc from 2017 to 2018 put together i think we we raised about 80 90 million which in that time used to be like quite a lot of money 600 crores almost yes and we grew 100x we raised this why because when everything was obviously um in 2015 to 2017 with everything was off in the winter like we just were focused in making the pmf happen and when the capital came like everything went up yeah so the thing that used to work for us <laughs> is like we used to start a presentation the first slide used to be a growth graph and then i had didn't have to say five lines also five words also i'm saying it used to be that people look at your work and see hey this is what you are doing and they want to be part of the journey but the mission statement like if you still want to know like hey what did we pitch people we said our mission statement is our goal is how do we really democratize e-commerce in india for a billion consumers 100 million small businesses and about 10 million more logistics entrepreneurs right that's why we started the company and we our mission statement was this in 2015 and our mission statement still this today and i think it will take a lifetime to even get closer to that yeah. mission statement but i think that's worth it yeah it's worth trying uh, to get absolutely. there absolutely no no thank you for sharing that <laughs> i think let's get into uh, some rapid fire Uh, it's not current your style <laughs> but um, if you need water you should take now <laughs> <laughs> because then it's non stop how many questions do you have it will last 3 4 minutes oh. that's it but we'll cover a lot of ground <laughs> so you went to it delhi uh, but you're from from bangalore and you've been in bangalore for some time so which city do you like i love bangalore And which city do you hate? Huh? And by extension, do you hate Delhi or? No, no, I don't. Like I grew up in Delhi. Like I, I grew up in Delhi. My schooling was in Delhi. My college was in Delhi. So, Delhi is also close to me. But I think I love Bangalore. And if you ask me why I love Bangalore, because I love people here. Everyone is a migrant, so people have much higher levels of empathy, right? More diverse audience. Everyone knows everyone's an outsider. Delhi may like people are not as welcoming to hmm. people from outside. <laughs> you know that it's a very homogeneous place and that's why it never builds empathy so i just like yeah. people here obviously i love the weather 
I've always loved playing sports and this weather allows me to play it every day. So yeah, many reasons. Great. And that's the second question. What do you love doing the most when not at work? I, I love following tennis. Like I play tennis. Um, I follow tennis quite a lot. So yeah, it's one of my passions. Is going to Wimbledon on your bucket list or is that already ticked? So last year, so basically because of the pandemic, I couldn't travel. So last year, I, I travelled for US Open, Wimbledon, French Open, one year. Oh, so amazing. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. It has been on my bucket list for the longest time. We'll go sometime together. Absolutely. <laughs> and I'm sure with you, we'll get the box seat. <laughs> so, who's your favourite celebrity? Celebrity is a very broad term. You pick like some... Bollywood, Hollywood, sports. Uh, Nadal, like Rafa. Nadal. I'm a big Rafa fan. Great. Um, if you weren't a startup founder, what would you be doing? Uh, a practical answer or an impractical answer? Both. Huh? Both. One is a wishful answer is what you're saying. If an if a impractical answer, maybe I would have been an archaeologist. So, archaeologist? Uh, yeah. So I'm a big history buff and I love history. So I like to try and travel, travel to places and see like why hap something happened at a particular time and I find that to be very intriguing. But I've realized that's not a profession that pays you well. So it's a more impractical answer. So impractically, archaeologist. Practically, if I was not an entrepreneur, um, who would I be? I think I would still be part of a startup. I would, like, I think in alternate universe, both Sanjeev and I would have tried and failed and then gone back and joined another startup. So I think yeah. that's what I've been doing. Got it. Got it. But I think I don't think anybody anybody here would have guessed archaeologist. <laughs> uh, uh, what is your morning routine? Oh, morning routine. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I get up around around six a.m. I play generally for an hour. Um, um, then I tend to read. So basically, another thing which I do after tennis is like I like to read a lot. History is a big part of that, but otherwise. I read a lot of non-fiction. I read almost everything. History a lot more. Yeah, I think that's it. Like not much have to. But you, you're, you're sort of saving the morning to yourself, basically. Yeah, yeah. So morning is the only time. Like I'm a early riser, early sleeper type. Right? So I go back home by like nine. And I sleep by nine thirty. So it's not a. And not did, did you always have a morning routine or? Uh, yeah, I've always had. I think a lot of that is mostly from my dad. My dad like forced me when I was growing up to get up at like 5 a.m. So even in college, which most people don't do, like I used to get up at 5 because I had a habit <laughs> for so long in life. Uh, now it's become 6 because I've realized sleeping for 8 hours is more important than getting up early. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a startup leader who inspires you the most? Um, like only Indian or international? Anybody. So, startup leader who inspires me a lot, I would say it was Steve Jobs. Um, because again, I feel like all journeys, all great journeys are non-linear. And knowing his autobiography, I think it's, I find that journey to be quite inspiring. So, so yeah, I, I would say like that one. Okay. One lesson you've learned which you still hold very close to your heart. Something that, you know, comes back to you almost every week. So I think there's one lesson that I, I think I have found very useful. Um, and this is the lesson that I learned growing up um, in a lower middle class family with my parents. So like my parents always told me that, hey, like whatever you will do is basically going up. So even if you fail, it's fine. You stay where you are. So never ever take pressure around, hey, if you fail, what will happen? And I think this mindset of, over time, I build this mindset, which is very resilient, uh, a sort of resilience mindset around that, hey, whenever things don't work out, I'm generally okay. I think being okay with failure is something that helped us quite a lot. I think that was one of the reasons why Sanjeev and I could do three pivots without ever feeling, hey, the first two were not working. Yeah. Right? Because the harder part of running in starting a startup is almost always emotional. Every day you get up, you try something and you fail and then you do it again and then you fail again and then you keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it and it's tough. Yeah. And emotionally then you start to give up, you start, you start to think maybe I'm not as good enough, 
you see that hey a lot, lot of people around you ask like your parents call you hey how's it going and then you every time you have to say it's not working it feels wrong right yeah but i think this mindset of being okay with failure is something which my parents taught me and has helped me a lot i think a lot of people don't have it like the pressure of hey that you come from nothing everything that you'll do is upside there's no downside makes you take risks without yeah. as much pressure or pressure or fear or anything judgment even correct and i think i have it gets harder and harder as you achieve more in life and the thing is i try to kind of remind myself of the same thing even today like yeah i think that mindset is very important because i've seen like a lot of people who start startups are people who are risk takers right yeah at the end of the day like by definition you are but you start with nothing so you take risks so it's only upside zero downside we start from zero but now when you reach 100 then you have something to lose, lose. Yeah. but for you to really continue to create exponential value you have to keep taking risks and that's when i've seen a lot of people start to falter yeah they'll yeah. say now i have this value to preserve so should i focus on preserving this value or should i focus on creating value and they can feel at odds with each other so i feel like this value from my parents has helped me quite a lot no no that's an amazing amazing uh, insight for all of us um what advice would you give to a 20 year old with it we do have another 20 year old with it here but uh. <laughs> what advice would i give them i would say discover what you want to do in life like sooner i think it's a tough question like everyone wants to maybe i think if i could change something i would have started sooner than what i did i think the more naive you are the better the mm. easier it is to kind of start up um so maybe if i had done it in 20 i started when i was 24 maybe if i had done it like 20 you'd have been better okay okay one must read book according to you one must read book so maybe let me give you one fiction and one non fiction um um fiction there's a book i like which is called paradise by abdul razak gunra um it's a book i so the book i had read back in college called heart of darkness by joseph conrad so this is a book which is very similar to that about africa so i really like this book so in fiction someone likes you should read um non fiction the book that has helped me quite a lot in my entrepreneurial journey is hard thing about hard things so I think Indian ecosystem, even today, is still not as open. I, when I meet an entrepreneur, and I've done that like the last eight years, every time I meet them and say how's everything, people say sub badiya, everything is all good, <laughs> right? Even though like the house is always on fire, but people still don't feel very comfortable in sharing for the same thing. If I share my vulnerability, will someone exploit it at some point in time? Yeah. Right. Um, and now you being an entrepreneur, you'll also realize this that sometimes like sharing is better because hey, everyone. is facing the same challenges if you are more open it will help so the fact that we have to go to a book <laughs> and like get answers to some of the problems we struggle with and not ask people around us i think is not a great thing but it's true yeah. so something we all need to change yeah so every time i've been in a hard a hard place especially the first few years that's a book that helped me quite a lot yeah yeah uh one most important attribute you look for while hiring growth mindset growth mindset and how do you assess that I generally ask people like um very so I try to put people in an uncomfortable situation I ask them you tell me like one place where you've miserably failed in the last 5 years and what did you learn from that Most people don't accept expect Got this like this is the old old question used to be in our strengths and weaknesses yeah. so I'm saying you I am asking you tell me where did you fail Yeah and I see like some people suddenly go pale and they don't know what to say they'll say hey if I really share where I failed like is it like bad on me and i can see when people give safe answer they don't have good growth mindset so uh, i can see that they're trying to like hide they're trying to show they are good at something while saying that hey this is what i failed at um but yeah i think that's a question that generally gives me and some people are very open that hey i did this maybe i was too young i learned it and over time i have to do try to do better some people are more open in sharing this yeah i I feel like people are also more open in sharing their vulnerabilities. It's easier to trust those people. 
right? Because you know that they're more honest as compared to some of the other people. So I think that's another benefit of looking for growth mindset. You tend to get people who are kinder and more honest in general. Yeah, and maybe even more humble. Correct. Great. I think last question, what is the most memorable news headline uh, that you remember about yourself? Wow, no one has asked me this question. Memorable news. Could be for yes. good or bad reasons. But I don't uh, remember any news. What news? I think the only, I don't know if it's a memorable news, but I get to know news about me because <laughs> my parents share it with me with so much excitement. Right? Like they will come and take photograph, they will go buy all newspapers where it has come, they will cut those <laughs> snippets, keep it somewhere. When I, I don't know why do you do it. So I think the most memorable part of all news is basically my parents being so excited about it. Um, and, and my parents, like again, from my, like I come from a farming background, so very hard for my parents to really understand what we do and what is good, what is bad. So my parents' assessment of whether the company is doing well is how many times news <laughs> comes in the newspaper. <laughs> so like my parents, for example, will come and say, hey, do I have anything else? All okay. <laughs> so, so yeah, I think that's yeah, the, I think that's, that's the, fun I think that's the parent's barometer <laughs> of how, how good the things are. So no, great. I think we can uh, close now. A, a big shout of uh, applause to Vedit. <laughs>